Anyway, it's good to see everyone here, and we will forego announcements this morning. We have these lovely bulletins that you all received when you came in, and uh, they're worthy of reading. So I won't uh, insult your intelligence by reading it to you, and you can uh, look and see what's going on in the church this week. And uh, Joel, come on and uh, give us our call to worship. Well, good morning. Go ahead and turn in your Bible to uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 3 through 9, and then if you'll stand with us as we read uh, our scripture this morning. Starting in verse 3, that which we have seen and heard, we pro proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship with the Father, and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message that we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's pray. Father, we're just so thankful for the salvation that you um, have given to us, and we're just, uh, we're just so blessed by you. We're so thankful for our time together this morning, and I'm um, just... Help us to just worship you with open hearts and to um, learn as, as Brother Gary brings the message this morning. And we just thank you um, for, for everything that you do for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Now let's remain standing isn't it, as we begin worshiping together. I found a friend who is all to me. I'm safe. Safe, safe. I found a
please be seated. Yes, please be seated. Um, well, it's an honor to be able to be here with you today. Uh, Brother Jim lined me up a couple of months ago. I'll talk about my accident and recovery here in a little bit. But uh, right now, I want to look at the prayer list. Uh, you should have had one inside your bulletin, so you might pull that out and be looking at it. I'm not going to go over all the names today, but, uh, but, but they're um, certainly there with significance for the you to take notice of and to be prayed for and be lifting each other up. Uh, the new additions, though, I will share. Uh, Raymond Burton, as he's uh, going to be going on a mission trip to Guatemala. Jay Clark, who's now on hospice. Uh, with cancer, uh, the Hoagland family at the death of, of this, their son Frank, Donna Lindsay, um, autoimmune hepatitis is in St. Francis, Blake Menez in spiritual battle, a friend of Jack Bolton, and of course do remember Brother Jim and Lori and Thomas and Chrissy as they're attending our the national convention down in New Orleans. Uh, pray for the convention. There is, there are some very important things that are happening and going on, and I, I'm, I'm not quite sure sometimes exactly what to pray for in this. I'd always like to pray for unity, but more importantly, I want to pray for the convention to simply honor God's word. Amen. You know, uh, because sometimes um, unity may not happen. Um, you know, it should in Christ, but sometimes it may not. But the one thing we've got to make sure of, whether it's the national convention, our state, our local association, or our church, we've got to make sure we're obedient to God's word. That's it. So be praying for that, if you would, please. And, of course, our, our, our servicemen and women, uh, as they... Um, as they serve our country in those in those certain ways, uh, I, I told Jim yesterday before he left town I wanted to do something a little different during the prayer time, and he just said go for it. So I have the pastoral approval on this. Okay, um, but if you have a special need going on in your life right now, maybe it's a family member. I've already been told of some this morning. Maybe there's something else is going on, and and it's private, but still you're in need of prayer. Would you do, do me a favor? Would you just raise your hand right now? There's hands up everywhere. Now keep them up just for a moment because I want others to look around and see the hands that are up. And what I want you to do is just look at these people with their hands up, and I want you to be lifting them up in prayer as we pray here in just a moment, okay? So please do that because every one of these is significant, and every one of these sh should be brought before the throne of God. Amen. Amen. And uh, God's the one that can handle it, not us. He can. I'm going to ask at this time for our ushers to come forward, and uh, we're going to have a prayer. I'm going to pray, and uh, we'll have the offering. But, of course, I want to pray for these needs that have just been presented before us. And as I'm praying, you also pray for these that you saw their hands up. If you would do that, please, all right? All right, let's bow our heads together at this time. Our Father in heaven, Lord, you are so wonderful. Your ways are so far above our ways. Our understanding is so limited when it comes to you. But Father, what we do know is what you have shared with us through your son Jesus. That your love is immense. That it reaches to the highest mountain in the deepest sea. It reaches to the uttermost as well as the guttermost. It reaches to every one of us. And Father, along with that love is also what you have done in your spirit within us in leading us, in guiding us, in comforting us, Father, and giving us the strength to go on that sometimes we don't know if we can or not. And Father, we bring our petitions before you with thanksgiving. We praise you for who you are and for what you've done and what you're going to do. But also we lift up these special needs to you today. Because, Father, every one of them is born out of a loving heart, a heart of concern. And, Father, you alone are the one that can touch every one of these. You are the, lo uh, the only one that can, that can heal mentally, emotionally, physically, and most certainly spiritually. And so I pray for all of your healing to take place as you have appointed it to do so. 
And Father, sometimes the healing doesn't always come in the way that we expect it. Maybe the healing is there to be put in a place to held in reserve in a way or just to touch us in a different way so that we'll have a testimony that we've not had before. But Father, for each and every one of these that raise their hands and for each and every one of us, <laughs> even if we didn't, simply pour out your Spirit upon us today. Father, help me as I share your word today. But let us listen to your Spirit more than anything else. Take this offering Bless it for your purposes, Father, as we extend your kingdom, as we reach out in love to others and minister to them. And we praise you for it all. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. one of the beautiful uh, great hymns of our faith sin had left a crimson stain 
But Jesus washed it white as snow. Amen. 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 Last week we learned a, a, a new song that goes right hand in hand with that. <clears throat> there is one gospel for which I stand. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. strength when I am weak you're the treasure
seeking you as the precious jewel. Lord, to give up might be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Thank you, my sin, my cross, my shame. Rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Lift it up now. King of kings, in the darkness you were waiting. In the darkness you were waiting, without hope, without light. Till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes. To fulfill the law and prophets, to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt let's praise him together praise the father praise the father praise the Till that stone was moved for good, 
for the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, and the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not fade. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Let's pray together and just praise him this morning for who he is, thank him for what he's done in our lives. Father, we praise you this day because you are worthy of our praise. Lord, you alone we worship. And Father, we realize that all good and perfect gifts come from above. And God, we thank you for those this day. Lord, accept our praise. May it be a sweet savor to you. And Lord, I just pray as Brother Gary comes after uh, Lord and I sing that uh, you would just stand... Uh, behind him, Lord, give him the uh, uh, strength that he needs to bring your word. And uh, Lord, we just love you this day. In your precious name we pray. Amen.
Well, that scared me. <laughs> I didn't think I was going to do a follow-up after they sang. Oh, my, what beautiful music today. I, I've, if my teaching goes a little shorter than I planned, then give Brother Matt the credit because I couldn't help but sing along with the worship time. So I may have used up my, a lot of my voice with that. And if it goes a little longer than expected, uh, I was inspired by the music, so blame Brother Matt for that. Okay, it's, it's an honor to be here today, always to be in God's uh, pulpit and to share his word with you. Um, here's what happened. A lot of stories are going out about my accident and what happened and things like that. You know, a truck hit me, knocked me into a car. You know, a dog attacked me, just all these different things. So I'm going to set the record straight and tell you exactly what happened. It's three weeks ago yesterday. I was innocently riding my bicycle. Don't you love it when I put those little phrases in there like innocently, like how could you be guilty riding a bicycle? Anyway, I'm riding my bicycle on the sidewalk along Highway 59, and a truck uh, decided to stop and block the sidewalk. And they're not supposed to do that. So I put my brakes on, and before I got to him, he started pulling forward, and I made the very incorrect assumption that he was going to go ahead and move on out of the way into traffic. And he pulled forward about two feet and stopped again, and I was not able to stop in time. And my bicycle hit the, si the back side of his truck, and it bounced off. I went forward, and on the top of the bed of the truck is where my throat hit. And it threw me back about 10 or 12 feet. The only thing I remember is just the initial contact with the truck, and the next thing I know, I'm opening my eyes, and I'm laying in the grass. I'm taking stock of things. Nothing feels bad except for my throat. Nothing felt bad until... The driver of the truck, he backed up. He came, talked to somebody for a few moments, then came over to check on me. I thought. <laughs> but he, he looked down on me, and he said, you ran into my truck. You scratched it up. <laughs> my only thought was, please tell me you're not a pastor or a chaplain. I don't think he would qualify with that one. So anyway, I was taken to the hospital. Uh, they sent me on up to, to Joplin for overnight observation, which only lasted till midnight. And um, anyway, here's my thing. Thank you so much for all the prayers, for your cards, for your words of encouragement. Um, they have meant a lot to me, and, and I'm about 90% healed now. I had a hematoma in my throat from the, uh, from the accident, and it's completely cleared up. Uh, Dr. Allen looked at it Friday, and he says, it's like it wasn't even there. I said, well, that's what prayer does. So I thank you so much for that. Now, along with all those words of encouragement, there also came a lot of other, a lot of other comments my way. From a multitude of you. And I kept telling you, even though I couldn't talk for 10 days, that I could still remember things. <laughs> so today, I just put in the bill, I had Terry put in the bulletin, I'm just teaching from 1 John. But actually, I'm going to be focusing on one verse, 1 John 1, nine. If we confess our sins. <laughs> so at the invitation time today, there's several of you that need to be down here at the altar, okay? And you know who you are. But I won't call any of you out by name unless you don't come down to the altar. <laughs> Quinn, did you hear that okay? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Not going to call anybody out. Okay. Here's what we want to do this morning. Go ahead and start that, uh, my PowerPoint, if you would. Because what I want to share today is the reality of the Christian walk out of 1 John. There we are. Good deal. Glad it's showing up. The book of 1 John uh, deals with reality. It's written and was written and still is written to confront the false doctrines and to give assurance to believers. By this time, there are a lot of things floating around and the church, some of the people in the church, not grounded as, they, as we are in the Word, didn't have it in front of them. 
but they weren't grounded enough to know what was true and what was false. And so John, in the leading of the Spirit, wrote down 1 John for us. And, he, and it's another example of how God always gives assurance to his children. And it's always based upon his reality of who he is. And so that's what we have in 1 John. And um, uh, John, uh, I, I'm going to share a couple of verses leading into verse 9. But... Um, John shares the, uh, defines the standard for our lives in verse 5 when he says that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. That is the fixed reference point, okay? You've got to have something solid to depend upon, to stand upon, and God is the one that never changes. And so therefore, he's our fixed reference point in life. Therefore, no matter what conditions are going on and things that are going on around us, it won't matter because God doesn't move. God is still there in all of his love and his mercy and his grace and all of his encouragement for us and his comfort for us and everything that we need. He's always there despite any situation that we might encounter. Now, following this statement are a series of conditional if statements. And the first one we, we see on the screen, if we say that we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So, you know, if, if we're going to say that we're following God, then that means we've got to walk in his fellowship. We say that we have fellowship with him, do we? Now, here's the thing. I want to share some things about this fellowship because it's extremely special. In fact, this fellowship really could be called the focus of the book of First John. And it should be a focus in our lives. The fellowship of the Father and the Son, it was from the very beginning. It's critical and essential in our Christian walk. It's fundamental in our relationship with God and expresses God's desire for his children. And so look, as you can see, it was from the beginning. The Lamb was foreknown before the foundation of the world, according to 1 Peter 1.20. The Lamb was slain before the foundation of the world, according to Revelation 13.8. And certainly we were chosen in Him before the foundation of the world. Therefore, this is, this is what blows my mind, we are included in this fellowship with the Father and the Son. What was Jesus doing before he came to earth? He was enjoying the fellowship with the Father. What did he do when he came to the earth? He enjoyed the fellowship of the Father. He walked in it constantly. The only one time it was ever broken is when he hung on the cross for us and became sin for us. And he had to cry out, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? It was the fellowship that was broken. And so therefore, if we can lock in on this fellowship and keep that ever before us, and know that this is what God intends for us, and it's always been intended for us before he even created the world, that, my friends, is something special. That is something that should lift us up each and every day. When did God first think of me? It wasn't on the cross. He had already thought of you before he even created the world, and he had planned for you to enjoy the fellowship with he and Jesus. Now, we get back to the uh, uh, conditional if statements, if you would. Uh, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, and that is Christ-likeness, people. That is our goal, not heaven. Heaven's a prize. Christ-likeness is the goal of where we should be going each and every day. And then if we say we have no sin, then you know what? We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. All of these things are if statements, but then he comes up on the greatest if statement in the first chapter. And that is our verse today as we look at that. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, we, 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 I think we know that to confess means to agree with God, but it means something even greater than that, as you can see. It means to consent to the desire of another. You see, it's not simply saying, God, I'm sorry, I regret what I did. I need your help, so I won't do that. I, it's more than that. It's I desire to follow everything that you've given me. It, everybody, anybody can say, I'm sorry that I sinned. But God has a greater desire for us than that. He desires that every one of us enter into this eternal fellowship with him through his son, Jesus Christ. And if we're missing out on the fellowship, we're missing it, period. 
Here he is laying it out for us. What did you desire from your children? Well, you certainly desired obedience, I would think. But I would hope that you desired a loving relationship with each of them. That you wanted them constantly in your stead, in, 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 in that fellowship with you. If one of our boys, if he, if he sinned, if he did something wrong, was disobedient in some way, the last thing I would want him to do would be to, to be so ashamed that he would run away and never see me again. Or go to his room and just hide out there. Sometimes they tried that for a little while, but Christy and I caught on. No, I want him to come back to me and say, Dad, I really did something wrong. I blew it. And by the way, they heard their dad say that to them several times too. I blew it. But I want him to come back because why? Because I want that fellowship with him. I want that relationship with him. God desires this of every one of us as his children that we remain in the fellowship he gave us in Jesus. So if we confess, if we agree with God, if we align ourselves with the standard of light and truth and all that comes as a result of it, that new covenant of grace in Christ, we have this fellowship. Just please understand this. Confession of our sins should never be seen as casual. Never. And I think there are times that as believers, God is so good and he pours out so much force and he wraps us in, our, in his loving arms so much that we, we get in that comfort zone. And all of a sudden we sin and we're going like, well, see, I'm, I'm a little irritated. But God, it'll be all right. It'll be all right. You know, just, just take me back, God. It's never casual. It should always break our hearts that we have sinned against the Father. Now, as I was looking at this, I wanted a, a really good illustration of how important and how significant it is to pour ourselves out before him. And so I went back and I looked at Psalms 51 because that's one of the most beautiful psalms ever written. And it's written for us, people. It is truly written for us. In reality, when we confess our sins to God, we're pleading out Psalms 51. Now, remember this. David was God's chosen one. We are his chosen ones before the foundation of the world. David was royalty. We are royalty as children of God and of the king. We are a royal priesthood. And also God, David had a heart for God. Guess what? Each one of us in Christ has been given a new heart. The old one is cast away. He's given us a new heart in which he lives so we identify with David very clearly in this. And unfortunately, we identify him when it comes to sinning because we still do. Now, we don't have to. 1 John, 1, uh, 1 John 2, 1, my little children, I write these things to you that you sin not. You don't have to, but we still do. We're in the flesh, and we still do. Don't use that as an excuse. It's just a fact. So here it is. Here's what David pours out. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your stead fast love. I like the fact that God's mercy is on the basis of his love, not justice. Okay? According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my in iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Let me tell you something. Confession, confession admits the reality of our sin. And we don't come to God and say, you know, like we do this with some other people. Well, if I've done something wrong, let me know. Come on. If we're coming to him in that place, we probably know we've done something wrong. And if they're not willing to tell us, they need to read scripture. And if they've been offended by us, they need to come to us. That's how it works. So don't, don't hold back. You know, if you've been offended, go and tell the person. Do it in the love of Jesus Christ, and all will be good. But here, David is pouring it out. He says, I know. My sin is ever before me. I know exactly what it is. I don't have to take the dart and try to hit a dartboard and figure out what sin it is. I know exactly what it is. And we all do, don't we? And he says, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Uh, a beautiful picture that the, the, the Israelites would have known exactly what David was talking about here because it relates back to Moses and the giving of the law. 
And, and after Moses had read the law and the people says, okay, God, everything you say we will do. Boy, that sounds so good at first, doesn't it? <laughs> and, and we do that. Hopefully we do that every day. Whatever you say, God, I will do. And what did Moses do? He took a hyssop branch, dipped it in the sacrificial blood, took it and sprinkled it on the people. The blood was applied to the people in that way because it was a covenant. So he's saying, purge me with this hyssop. I want to have this relationship restored. And he says, wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter to snow. It's a picture of darkness to light. It reminds me, it's a picture of the the scapegoat, of, of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And you had one goat that was taken and that was sacrificed at the uh, uh, Mithkald altar on the top of the Mount of Olives. That was the atonement goat. And the other one was the scapegoat. They take it and they put this red ribbon on it. And as they sent it out in the wilderness, after laying the sins, the high priest had put his hands on it, it would turn white. And it was a picture of God's forgiveness. God was giving them a sign. Now, it's interesting to note that that always turned from red to white until the last couple of years of Jesus' ministry. It no longer turned white. It remained red. And the picture, and and that's, that's recorded by rabbis. And I think the picture there is very clear. The goat was no longer the sacrificial goat, the atonement goat, the scapegoat. Jesus Christ had taken his place and was going to die on the cross for us in that way. Well, then finally, David says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. He wanted all of the cleansing of his sin taken care of so he'd have this clean heart. And he said, Cast me not away from your presence, because that lost presence was the interruption of this eternal fellowship. That's what was happening here. And David knew it in his heart. I don't have that fellowship that I had before. Restore to me the, the, the joy of my salvation. That's a, that's a key doctrinal point for us as believers, is it not? It's the security of the believer. David didn't lose a salvation. We don't lose our salvation when we sin, but we sure as heck lose the joy of our salvation. We're miserable because the Spirit will not let us get, he's abiding at us. He's not going to let us get away with breaking that fellowship. When we sin against God, as, as all sin is, we should be applying sackcloth and ashes to our soul because we have removed ourselves from the eternal fellowship with our Father and His Son that Jesus died to give us. People, we miss out on that joy and we miss out on the blessings of God when we remain in our sin. I think about that joy. Um, just the day before the... Uh, the finals started of the, uh, of the women's softball championship. You know, you knew I was going to work that in somewhere. Well, Jim would, so I mean, you know. Anyway, the OU softball team, the media was, in, you know, asking them all these questions and things like that. And one of them asked them about happiness in winning. And one of the girls responded, and she spoke for a lot of them on the team. They're very expressive of their faith in Christ, by the way. And one of them said, well, we're really not concerned with happiness. We're concerned with eternal joy. Happiness can come and go. But we have eternal joy in Jesus Christ. Print that. I thought it was wonderful. So we confess our sins. So what exactly do we receive from the Father in return? Well, Psalms 103, verses 10 through 12 express it very well. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward us, toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Isn't that beautiful? People, they're forever, eternally separated from us. They're gone because Jesus Christ paid the price. So what we receive from him is this incredible forgiveness and the separation of the sin from us. But also, 
Yes, as far as the east is the west, fly away. If we confess our sins, he is faithful. Now, his faithfulness is based upon this, as you can see on the screen. This is his blood covenant, and he's going to keep it. He had a blood covenant with the Son, Jesus Christ. And he has to keep it because Jesus Christ's atoning sacrifice is not in vain. And if he did not keep this blood covenant... If he did not give us his forgiveness when we confess to him, he would be in violation of the covenant, and God cannot do that. Never will, never would, but he cannot because it's against his character. It continues to come back to this fellowship idea, the, 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 the basis of it, the reality of it. Yes, our sins are forgiven in Christ. Yes, we have eternal life. But people, Jesus said in John 10, we also have abundant life. And that is walking in the fellowship of the Father and the Son. That's the abundant life. There are some out there that try to, you know, preach this prosperity gospel and da 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 da, da. Let me tell you something. That's not prosperity. Prosperity is the fellowship of the Father and the Son because it is eternal. That is prosperity, people. When we confess our sin, when we consent to his desires, based on the Father's faithfulness to the blood covenant, he must forgive our sin to restore the fellowship, otherwise known as the joy of our salvation. But we, we look at this and we wonder, well, why... We say he's faithful and just to forgive us. Why is just included here? What exactly does that mean? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad you asked. Because you see, his justice, his justice, he acts in it. It's legally satisfied by Christ. Jesus' redemption was once for all. It cannot, you cannot go back on it. It's a legal situation that is put in heaven's kingdom, in his legal court in heaven. It cannot be undone. He is just. He acts in his justice, but that was satisfied by Jesus Christ, not by us. And I love it. One of the songs we sang today, the cross where justice and mercy meet. His mercy is based on his love. His justice is based on Christ's sacrifice. He's given it all to us people. And then not only that, but to forgive us. Our sins have been sent away as far as the east is from the west, the Scripture shares in Psalms 103. Now, you always think about that. East and west, he didn't use north and south. He used east and west. Because you can start heading north, but eventually you're going to start going south. And if you go south toward the south pole, eventually you're going to make that turn. You're going to start going north. But if you start heading east, you're only going to keep going east. You can't catch up with east. It's always there before you. West, the same, the same way. In other words, you'll never recover those sins again because they're east and west away from you. There's no measurement for it. Well, what else do we receive from the Father? Well, it says to cleanse us. To cleanse us. To cleanse is a purification in a legal and a ceremonial sense. It was used in relation to leprosy in the days of Jesus. But also, it was used in a spiritual sense to purify from the pollution and the guilt of sin. Hebrews 10, says, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean, from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That's the living water of Jesus Christ that's talking about. Isn't that amazing? We come before him, and now we come before him. We don't have to stammer around and say, gee, Father, I really don't know how to tell you this, or gosh, I, I know I really messed up last week, and even though I've confessed it, I'm still kind of drudging around with it. We don't have to do that. We can come before him and cry out, Abba, Father, Daddy, I love you because he's restored us. He has cleansed us from everything that was wrong. You see, 1 John 1, 9, applied, gives the believer freedom. You see, not only have my sins been taken care of and been sent away, but so is my guilt. My guilt is gone. Oh, did I forget to put something up there? No, 
Because, see, that's a picture of our life. Once we give, once we have confession of our sins with God, once he has restored us, once he has brought us back into that beautiful fellowship with him that's unending, that is how God sees us all the time because we're in Christ, but that's how we can see ourselves now as well. And that, my friends, is extremely important. I... Uh, I have a lot of situations I deal with at the hospital. Larry Moore here, he's one of our chaplains and, and a dear friend. And he's had incredible years as a chaplain in, in uh, hospice as well. And we both understand the need of trying to help people in those last critical moments. This last year I met a gentleman. Uh, he was getting ready to have surgery. He wanted me to come in so he could share with me. So I did. He says, uh, Chaplain, I had an indiscretion early in my life, and I just need to get rid of that. And I said, well, here's the deal. You don't need to get rid of it with me. You simply need to talk to God. Have you ever confessed it to God? Now, he said he was a believer in Christ. He had different denomination group and not one focused on reading your Bible, studying your Bible, unfortunately. I said, have you confessed it to Christ? He goes, oh yeah, I confessed it to God. He says, I do it every day. I said, well, let me ask you this. Once you confess it to God, did you, did you ever do it again? He goes, oh no, never. And I said, so you truly repented. You confessed that you did it, but then you repented because you're, you haven't done it again. I said, that's the way it's supposed to be. And he says, yeah, I guess so. And I said, no, I know so. But here's the most important thing. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In other words, when you confess that sin the very first time to God, he blotted it out and sent it away. I said, the only one wanting to conjure up all that guilt in your life, so you have to keep doing this every day, you think, is Satan. He's the only one that's telling you you're not good enough to be a child of God. Well, in reality, none of us are good enough to be children of God, but because of Jesus Christ, we are children of God. You know, I looked at him and I said, you don't have to keep doing this. I said, do you believe that God is faithful? Well, yes. It says right in that verse, he's faithful to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Do you believe God? Absolutely. You believe his word? Absolutely. I said, then my friend, you never have to bring this thing up again. And when Satan tries to do it, say, I've already taken care of it with the Father, and I've got an advocate in Jesus Christ. It's a done deal in a court of law, and you can't touch me. This guy... It's just like the shackles had just been dropped off, the tremendous weight off his shoulders. He started, Larry, you've seen it in your patience, and they, they, they just had this break out in this big grin. For once, they've experienced freedom in their life. Well, let me move on. As I already shared, it is from all unrighteousness. Now, the Greek word, um, adikia, it's unrighteousness, and basically it is considered ultimately to be an act against God himself. David said, against you and you alone I have sinned, God. So all sin is against God. And unrighteousness in the Greek is adikia. But better than that is what righteousness is. Righteousness is dike, not Nike, but dike. And, it, and, and originally it meant an attitude or a manner of action, but it later became known as a standard. It denoted the right conduct, conduct in a situation and was applied in a legal sense as fulfilling the law. Think about that. The right conduct, a standard, and fulfilling the law. Sure sounds like Jesus to me. He's done all of those he always had perfect conduct. He is our standard of righteousness. He fulfilled the law. He is everything that righteousness is to represent. 
It's Jesus. And people, in confession, if we simply pour it out before the Father, He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness because we are robed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ alone. When Christ embraces us, the Father only sees His Son and His righteousness. I close with a story. Famous preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon used to tell this story. A certain English duke once boarded a, a galley ship. And as he passed by the crew of slaves, he, he asked several of them what their crimes were. Almost every man claimed that he was innocent. They laid the blame on someone else or they accused the judge of yielding to bribery. Until finally one young fellow spoke out. And he said, sir, I deserve to be here. I stole some money. No one is at fault but myself. I am guilty. Upon hearing this, the duke reached down and he seized him by the shoulder and he shouted at him, You scoundrel, you! What are you doing amongst all these honest men? Get out of their company at once. He was then set at liberty while the rest were left to tug at the oars. The key to the prisoner's freedom was the admission of his guilt, was confession. Confession of our sins is the key to our freedom in Christ and the restoration of the joy of our salvation, of this perfect eternal fellowship with the Father and the Son. I pray that you won't miss out on a second of it, to embrace it, to relish it, to cherish it, to hold it so close that nothing else can get in the way. God's fellowship, God's faithfulness, God's forgiveness brings us our freedom. Let's bow our heads together. Father in heaven, Lord, I know it's not always easy talking about our sin. Something we'd rather avoid. But Father, I pray that as we're in you in such a correct way as your children, that Father, sin is what we'll want to avoid. That Father, it will be before us as David's was. That your spirit will speak to our hearts. And Father, we'll realize we've got to do something about it. And the only thing to do is to come to you, a Father that holds his hands out to us, his loving arms out to embrace us fully in the righteousness of his Son, Jesus Christ. Father, there may be some here today that need to have some confession time with you. Father, I, I know it would, be, it would be so embarrassing if people come forward today that other people, oh my goodness, look, they're sinners. Well, Father, that's all of us. That's all of us. But I pray if there's others that need to come forward, maybe in prayer for someone else, maybe just asking strength on their own, Father, praying for our church, praying for another person here, whatever it may be, Father, let's not hold back. Let us be before you to embrace the fellowship that Jesus died to give us. I thank you for the eternal truth of your word. I thank you for what Jesus has accomplished for us. I thank you for what the Spirit is doing in our lives. I thank you for you that you continue to love us when we're so unlovable. But we praise you for it, and we thank you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Matt's going to lead us in our invitation song. If you'd like to come down and pray at the altar, wonderful. If you'd like for me to pray with you, I'd be glad to do so. Let's honor him. In the lightning flash of
thank you for being here today. Uh, Being an encouragement, encourage one another, lift each other up. There is an important vacation Bible school meeting immediately following. You're going to have a little luncheon. Now, even if you haven't already planned on serving in vacation Bible school, but you have some interest in it, please go to the meeting, and uh, they'll get you fixed up. Uh, there's, I don't know if there's anything greater than serving God's little children in, in our kingdom, all right? Well, thank you again for being here. Praise the Lord. Be praying for the convention for Brother Jim and Thomas. And uh, there's a journey home on uh, Thursday it is, all right? Matt, close us out, my friend. Thank you. As we go, may your spirit go before us. As we go, may we follow where you lead. May we live what we have learned. Share the message we have heard and be a light unto the world as we go.